um, goals to work on. Um, so uh, welcome back everyone. And I hope uh, that at least some online had a uh, enjoyable lunch or breakfast or whatever it is at your time zone. Um, uh, so um, this afternoon will mark um, a departure from our uh, our focus this morning, which was at a higher level, uh, conceptual and um, some interactive exploration of a model. This afternoon, we're going to be pressing ourselves to a different task, to wit. Um, we are going to be building up our first model. Okay, and we're gonna be uh, using this to explore some exercises uh, that, uh, some some activities that to which we'll be coming back again and again, because the, indeed the principles that we're going to be exploring here will be um, uh, virtually universal um, across uh, the models that we'll be building. And we'll give you a good sense of um, how the models we other, otherwise are building up um, have been composed, have been put together. Um, so you're going to be learning some good, simple, but nearly universal skills within engine-based modeling. And we're going to use it to deepen an understanding of some of the principles we talked about today and how these models illustrate principles of, of system science and um, uh, and how uh, by building up a model in the right way, we can probe emergent behavior and uh, recognize effects for alternative scenarios. So to that end, um, we will now turn ourselves to the task of, of working with a particular model. And our, our point, point of departure is indeed where we left off uh, before the raucous encounters uh, over lunch. Um, and in case there are um, uh, vocalizations drowned out some of the behavior we will recall we were working with or some of the memories we were working with this neighborhood mobility model um which we had downloaded we're going to close that model um uh and 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 open up uh, a different model but before that before we close it i want to slip in one final key And, and this is a point of profound significance when it comes to uh, age-based modeling and more broadly than it. And it has to do with something I had mentioned uh, before, before long. Uh, it has to do with the fact that when we um, use these models, data is valuable. Data informs or something. And we saw that before lunch that by running this model with different particular assumptions about behavior, we could get very different results. And those results, those outputs, the emergent behavior induced by the model with different assumptions was quite different. But I, I made a statement that when it comes to model, when it comes to dynamic model, Generally, our stances, data is, is quite contingent. It's contingent on context. It's contingent on uh, particular situations um, that evolve. Um, and what's what's often more um, fundamental for understanding behavior is structure, structure of the model. And uh, we capture structure in different ways. Here we capture it by you know structure involving uh, mobility with certain assumptions, and these assumptions can be challenged. But you know, for example, that uh, community visits occur following work days or school days. Um, more significantly, and more sort of commonly, we, we might have structure depicting progression of individuals between different states associated with health. Right, this natural history of infection. People go from a susceptible state by virtue of being infected. Um, 
They can then spread the infection. I won't go into it, but that's what that, that internal sort of link is and the infective state occurring once a day on average, is our, or a certain number of times per day, contacts per day. They expose other individuals in the population, and then they recover. That's This captures some element of structure. And while the particulars matter for the specifics of behavior, often the broad modes of behavior are dictated by the structure even more foundationally than they're dictated by by the particular assumptions. Also, although we may assume a 10% chance per day of recovering, the more basic things that we capture this progression. And my argument to you is that the behavior that we are elicited by the models will often depend profoundly on the structure of these models. We have an asymptomatic pathway, or we had an exposed state, for example, between susceptible and effective, we would see behavior that can be notably different and can exhibit different modes, different qualitative types of behavior based on that structure. Not merely variations in a small kind, but, but qualitatively different. And we're going to illustrate that with one final tweak to this model before we go on to building the model. And for this, I would like to seek your help. I would like to specifically request your help to modify this model. That's not something we've done thus far, right? We've, we've run, we opened it up, we explored it, we ran, not run, um, uh, a set of scenarios, and we saw different results. Now we're going to modify it. Now we're going to tweak it. Now we're going to throb it. We're going to adjust it, okay? So to this end, um, we're going to go to the palette here, and we are going to um, explore this palette. This this provides us our sort of set of building blocks for for building up these models okay? for for um, uh, building them in ways that that encode different assumptions about behavior, about the structure of a system. And in the palette, you'll actually see a bunch of specific palettes. You can see them running down here on the left-hand side. Um, I'm gonna call up the chat so I don't miss any questions here. But we see a bunch of sub-palettes here. Do you folks see that? See, okay. I'd like you, so these different sub-palettes will play um, uh, alternative roles in providing us with different toolboxes of structure that we can add to our model um, and capture different types of logic about the situation. I'd like you to go to the agent palette. So that's the red one with kind of a Da Vincian logo, kind of like the measure of man. Ever seen that Da Vinci? Um, famous Da Vinci drawing. Um, we're going to the palette. And uh, we'll see within the agent palette, there's a set of different components, including some state chart components. Alternatively, you go, could go to the state chart um, palette as well. But because the agent palette is a recurrent one, we'll, we'll um, uh, secure our, our goals there. Now, down in the state chart area of the agent palette, there's a transition. Do you see that? We're going to make use of it. So I'm going to ask you um, to tell me to provide some guidance as to uh, how this model might be modified. If we wanted to alter our theory, right now, the theory admits to someone starts susceptible, right? They, they all go initially to the susceptible state. That's what that topmost sort of entry point is from that point along the top. Um, by being infected, they can grow infected, and then they can recover, and they do recover over time with a certain probability per day. But right now, once they recover, always recovered. What if we wanted to allow a person to lose immunity? So you can think right now, someone in the recovered state has immunity. They can't be infected again. They can only be infected, but at susceptible. That's because there's this this transition from there with this, this handling a message. That's the kind of the mechanism by which they get infected. 
and no other state has that. So they can only be infected here. What if, so once they're here, essentially they're immune from then on. What if we wanted to allow immunity to wane over time, to lapse, to over time be lost? What, would, what might we do to the structure of this model to have them, to describe the fact that they can lose immunity, that they can become susceptible again? Jared. Loop back to susceptible. And uh, Jared is exactly right, it's normal. So we're, we're gonna put in, we're gonna drag from the palette. We've never done this before. So make sure you're in this agent um, thing down in the state chart. If this is collapsed, make sure it's open. So you're gonna go to transition. You're gonna, gonna click on it and you're going to drag in like that, okay? And basically you're gonna drag in until you see it turn green. Do you see that green? In the upper part of that of that transition, as I drag it right now, it's the upper part where my mouse is. Um, it's uh, it's it's uh, white, right? Um, the upper part of it, the supial. You see it; it's white, and then we're going to drag it here, right? And you can see it turns green. Do you see it turning green? See or not? You see it's green, the upper part. Okay, so. You can let it go there and then drag, go and click this other part, these, this so-called handle and drag it up to susceptible, okay? And what we're gonna do with the details of this, but first I want you to make sure that it's connected both sides. Notice green, green. Green is the color in state charts of the game. This, this weaves it together. Do you see that? So green down here, I've recovered, see this? little handle, it's green, and green up where it hits this. Do you see that? Just make sure it's green, because if it stays if it stays white, you 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 may think it's connected, but believe me, it ain't connected. If, it, if it's something like this, it may, may even look connected in some way, if I sort of drag that nearby, but, but unless it's green, it's not really connected. Are we okay with that? Just, it can be finicky, so you got to be a bit careful, okay? Okay, um, now to, to improve the aesthetics of this, you could double click in here. This, this is purely an aesthetic thing. If you double click there and you drag out, um, we can drag it out like that and, and you could leave it like that. But I think for my preference, I, maybe I'll, I'll draw it out like this and create something with a little bit more symmetry. Again, bending it has no impact on the logical function. It simply allows it to be visually clear. And that's important. In the human theater of modeling, where you want to show people model assumptions, you want to show them the structure that you've captured in the model. Being able to have it have it have uh, a parsable, visually understandable connection structure is important. And that means putting a bit of attention in to colors, to routing of things, et cetera. So here we have a, a mechanism to lose immunity, but we're not done yet. We're not done yet. We have to say, how does this come about? And right now, this is a transition. This encodes an action going from recovered to susceptible, but what sort of assumption does this have? It's actually encoded in the properties. You notice when, when you select an object in any logic, there's this properties window. If you don't see properties, if I were to, don't do this right now, but if, if I were to close this, I could always go to the view menu and call it up again. There we are. So how quickly does someone lose immunity right now in this model? Can anyone say? You look at the assumption associated with those properties. Hundred percent of people do after one hour. Yeah, they, they <laughs> lose it after an hour. Not really very long, even compared to the relatively short infection um, uh, durations of things like chlamydia and gonorrhea. Okay, so let's um, uh, with it. Uh, okay, so we're going to train change this. First of all, we're going to give it a name. We're going to say waning immunity. Let's let's not call it transition one or something. Okay. Um, and we're gonna click show name 
because it's it's good to give it a clear name visually. And you'll notice that when I did that, it appeared, there's a name that appeared down, way down here. It's underlined and as underlined, I can I can kind of drag it around. So I, I'm calling it waning, waning immunity. Maybe I'll put it down there, okay? So that's its name, but more significantly for model behavior, I'm gonna make it a rate transition, okay? And as a rate transition, I'm going to make it a, a, a per hour. I'll say that um, people remain. So 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 we have to say um, what's the chance per unit time that they develop immunity? Okay. Um, so I'm going to say they lose immunity, let's say, in, uh, let's say, uh, I'll say uh, 60 days. I'm, I'm thinking about something like chlamydia or something they, they might get over. So I'm going to say 60 days. So 1.0 divided by 60, I'm going to say 60.0 times 24. So we could put it this way, but... There's actually a um, a nicer way to do it. I think I'll leave it like that and we'll show the nicer way with, uh, to convert between you know. So what I'm saying is 60 times 24 is the number of hours in 60 days. And this, the fact that it's one divided by this, it turns out mathematically means that on average, it's an exponential distribution of residence time. What that means is their chance per unit time, if they're in that, remain in that state, their chance per unit time, um, uh, their chance of leaving per unit time remains the same no matter how long they've been in that state. And uh, the chance per unit time is uh, of leaving, we'll call it some alpha. So this is given by e to the minus alpha t. This is, uh, this is for you who are more quantitative. I'll just mention this is an exponential distribution of time that they remain in that state. And the mean of that, the average time until they leave, um, turns out to be one divided by alpha. So this is like mean time to leave is mean time uh, to leave is is uh one over alpha um or equally uh alpha is one over the mean time to leave um so so we're going to make this one divided by this if this was one divided by 10.0 meaning 10 hours on average they recover if this is one divided by 24.0, meaning on average they remain infected for one, uh, or they retain immunity for one day. Um, this is one divided by 64.0, so they remain on average uh, infected for 60 days. Okay. Okay. So, so we put that in there. They remain infected for 60 days. We've changed the structure of the model. How do you think this might affect things in the model? The fact that people can lose immunity. Anyone? The model doesn't end now. Sorry? The model doesn't end now. Uh, the model actually is set up at the moment. It's set up to run for all these scenarios. You're right that the model itself doesn't say to end. But all these scenarios, turns out, um, are set up to run for one year. That's 8760 hours. So how do you think like losing immunity might affect things? Anyone? People can lose immunity in two months on average? Well, it's, we could try to think it through, but we can also explore visually. Often it's good to kind of Muse about it and think through. Good to challenge your your thinking. Um, I'm going to run this and uh, here we go. So we're going to run this out 
full tilt. And at first it doesn't look too different than early. But something rather, well, you tell me, how similar is this to what we saw earlier? Is it different? Is it similar? What happened before in our previous runs um, as we ran it out? Does anyone remember what happened to the prevalence of infection? Yes. Sorry? Well, well, okay, here, but what happened before? Went to zero. Prevalence of infection went to zero. And does anyone remember for the baseline, what, what was the cumulative incidence? If, the total number of people infected over time in the in the baseline scenario, schools were open, workplaces were open, there was full engagement in the community. Does anyone remember how many people typically got infected? It was about 500, right? There were some flukes potentially where somehow would head off, but if it got established, go to 500. How many infections are there now that happen over the course of? More or fewer? <laughs> More, more. Now we'll we'll come back to 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 musing about this, but this died out earlier, somewhere around here maybe. What's going on now? Who are you know, who from recovers to susceptible and getting reinfected and good anyway. Good and. And you'll notice that it goes to a, a roughly similar level. You see that? It sort of oscillates around. It kind of knocks around this level, right, of infection. But remember, these aren't our only graphs. Um, here are the count of times infected. What is, what's the single most common number of times that someone's infected? This is between six and 7.2. So it's somewhere between six and 7.2 times um, is the most common uh, level. Okay, thank you, Nana. Um, okay, good. I, I see some good commentary in, in the chat. Where are people being infected? Well, that doesn't change too much. Where's the most common place people are being infected? Oh, and then after that, workplace, yeah, yeah. Um, minimal people are getting infected while traveling, you know, back and forth. Um, now we could we could perform all the analyses before, but I I do want to muse about this. What do you? What's what's going? I mean, this curve looks yeah. a little bit curious, right? There's a structure to this, and, and here's the thing, please. In 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 system dynamics, and but it's a so, so principle I apply to all dynamic modeling, we talk a lot about structure determines behavior. The structure of a model dictates, not behavior exactly, but the possible behaviors. If you change the structure, the possible behaviors changes often quite dramatically. The particular assumptions you make, particular parameter values you use, for example, change the behavior within the range of possible behaviors um, and in some cases, it can make quite a difference, like shifting it to across the tipping point. So it's not to be minimized. But often, when you change the structure of a model, like adding a waning of immunity, it profoundly changes the possible behaviors of a model, profoundly changes what is possible. It might lead to oscillations being possible that were never possible before or some sort of equilibrium behavior that wouldn't be, um, that wouldn't stay, you know, in place for endemic equilibrium where people, um, um, you know, with the number of people being infected uh, at any one time stays well above zero. What's going on with that? Can anyone try to build up some understanding of what might be going on here? If we had time, I'd, I'd actually explore it a bit dynamically. We watch this curve just above as it sweeps out the first part of this and then sweeps there. Maybe I can wet your thinking by doing exactly that. So I'm gonna I'm gonna stop this. 
There we go. And we are going to run it again. I could have probably just run it again from that window, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna call it up again and here we go. Um, and I'm gonna run it kind of in, in, in slow-mo kind of, um, okay, so here we go. And we're gonna be watching that initial time here. And we're going to speed it up a little bit. There's some chance it may die out before, you know, it starts, but here we go. Okay, so count of times uh, infected, um, we should really have, yeah. Okay, so you tell me, um, uh, if we look at people in the population, what's the maximum number of times they've gotten infected? This is a histogram of, you know, what fraction of the population has been infected? Zero times, one time, if you went out there, two times. How many times have people gotten infected? Either what or what? Uh, yeah, zero or one. They're all getting infected, we might say, for the first time, right? there, And you, you see it, you know, rising rapidly there. Can you tell me what's happening here? Well, people who have been susceptible from the start are getting infected, right? Now we're starting to see a, a more um, mixed thing. And unfortunately, it, um, well, nobody's been infected zero times, pretty much everyone at least once. And now you start to see it going up more slowly. And it has to do with what I just said. Pretty much everyone has gotten infected at least once. Now we're reinfecting people, right? Now we're on the slope of reinfecting people and it's limited. What is it limited by particularly? They're what? The waning of their immunity, right? And it, it can't just infect all these people out there. It's gotta wait until they lose their immunity to infect it, right? So it's, now we have a process that's limiting how many susceptible people there could be, and that provides a cap on how quickly it can spread. So these are, this is um, probably emblematic of the principle that structure determines behavior. If you alter structure, it can change radically the behavior. And we want a time to go into it, but if we were to explore, the behavior of this model for different scenarios um, in this context of endemic infection, infection that you know can stick around where where you have waning of immunity. I would assure you that the trade offs or the the impacts will be quite different than with um, a simple initial outbreak. Um, so bear that in mind. Structure determines behavior. By altering the structure of the model, we can often profoundly change the types of behavior, as well as the particular behaviors elicited for the specific set of parameters. So you've also, in this modest exercise, had your first little experience using the palette to build up a bit of structure in the model. And now, jointly, we will use those skills that you've been exercising in some small, modest way here to build up a much more substantial, richer model. May we proceed to that? Okay, so no one has run from the room with like their hair on fire um, screaming. So I think that's probably a good sign. Um, so. We will cease this small presentation on this, and uh, we will now